beyond the white beacons and sharp soaring cliffs, beyond the tumultuous surf breaking in endless ebb and flow, beyond the far horizon of rolling waves is a world about to wait. The world beneath the sea, for centuries unexplored and inaccessible to man. Not until recent years did man begin to take a serious and comprehensive look at the seas. To see them not as a mere barrier between continents, but as a treasure house of the earth, rich in precious resources. Oil, bauxite, manganese. A creator of the weather, which lashes the land and affects all men's lives and fortunes. Possessor of scientific secrets of a thousand kinds, which would enrich man's quest for knowledge. But how to open up this world? Men aboard ships could tell little about the many mysteries of the depths, and even submarines were of little aid. They could not go deep enough, and were not designed or equipped for scientific purposes. Specially designed ocean platforms were needed. Manned platforms and unmanned, mobile and stationary, flying platforms and floating ones. Platforms moving beneath the seas and sitting on the bottom. Whatever modern engineering ingenuity could conceive. And man himself had to move into the depths of the sea for personal observation and analysis. The assault on this unseen world must be total. The Office of Naval Research and many other agencies of the United States Navy early recognized the importance of ocean platforms and began programs to develop them. The platforms would produce vitally needed data about the dynamic forces of the oceans. For example, increased understanding of the strange behavior of sound in the sea and its confusing effect on sonar would permit the development of improved systems for the Navy's forces operating in the ocean environment. The first of the subsurface ocean platforms was William Beebe's bathysphere in 1934. It could be lowered on a cable to the unheard of depth of 3,000 feet. The real breakthrough came in the early 1950s with Auguste Picard's bathyscaphe Trieste, the first deep water self-propelled submersible. The habitable ball of the Trieste was almost exactly the size and shape of Beebe's bathysphere. The cigar-shaped hull contained only gasoline, a lifting agent in water. The Trieste was an underwater blimp. The Office of Naval Research recognized the potential of Trieste as a platform for undersea research, and in 1958 purchased the submersible. In 1960, in the waters off Guam, Lieutenant Don Walsh of the U.S. Navy and Dr. Jacques Picard made the most famous dive of all time going down to the very bottom of the Challenger Deep, the greatest known ocean depth in the world, 35,800 feet. Down, down dropped the Trieste, into worlds never before seen, down seven miles to the bottom, where man for the first time looked out into the deepest depths of the ocean, observed, photographed, and recorded its phenomena. The success of the dive proved the capabilities of Trieste, and the Navy began a continuing series of experimental dives in other areas of the world's oceans. Today, those dives continue with the Navy-built Trieste II. Dr. Eric Barham, a marine biologist at the Navy's Undersea Research and Development Center, San Diego, reminisces about the early dives. I was fortunate to be one of the first scientists to make dives in the bathyscaphe Trieste. That, of course, was uh, Trieste 1, and this is Trieste 2. And there have been a considerable number of technological improvements and additions. Closed circuit television, manipulators that can pick up and recover objects from the sea floor, external lighting that can be aimed, and cameras with their own strobe flash. And those days, we were diving in the San Diego trough, the depth of about 4,000 feet. We had only one port, and we had to share that with the pilot and with the cameras. If you want to take a picture, push your camera in the front of the port. Got through, pushed it to one side. 
When we went up and down, however, sometimes we did that in a hurry. And this created a tremendous vortex so that frequently the midwater organisms would be tumbled about in front of your eyes. And after we arrived on the seafloor and the sediment had cleared, we had a beautiful unobstructed view of the surrounding terrain and the associated organisms. It's hard to um, convey the, uh, the tremendous emotionalism and excitement that those early dives gave us. Heretofore, people have always tried to piece together the way animals lived in the ocean by dragging nets or trawls and getting pieces and hunks of them. And all of a sudden, here we could see these organisms, where they lived in their environment, what they did, and so forth. The Trieste one was the beginning, the beginning of the evolution of a whole new family of submersible vehicles, various crafts and platforms, which allows the scientists to enter the ocean environment and directly observe its contents and what goes on there. The successors to the original Trieste have come in many shapes and sizes, built for many purposes, both by the Navy and by industry. Sea Cliff and a twin sister called Turtle, owned and operated by the Navy, are used for both scientific research and training purposes. They have the most modern controls and instrumentation for work in the deep ocean. The Navy also uses commercial submersibles and instruments them for its own use. Moving along in the depths, man can now see and study the deep scattering layer, which confuses sonar, resulting in false or lost submarine contacts. By fully understanding this ocean phenomenon, the Navy can develop new concepts to improve its operations in the ocean environment. The marine biologist can now view the life of the depths for himself, photograph it, make notes immediately. Water motion has long been a subject of interest. The physical oceanographer can use a submersible to measure bottom currents, study minute topographic features, and calculate transport of sediment. This submersible's bow carries changeable sets of instruments developed by the Navy for instantaneous readings. And it can be fitted for other experiments. For example, sampling the water is accomplished by placing bottles on a rack on the bow and tripping each at precisely the instant the correct depth is reached. Temperature readings at the ocean floor. If the scientist wants a sample of the bottom or of small objects on it, he can whisk the sample into a bin and take it to the surface for study. He can even capture an interesting specimen, like this jellyfish, a giant medusa. Never before have scientists been able to study the exact terrain of the ocean floor. The great canyons and rugged mountains and sandy plains which make up the world beneath the sea are at last open to their eyes and cameras and recording instruments. The new submersibles are the ocean platforms of the future, already on duty today, with eager scientists uncovering new knowledge on every expedition. Other types of ocean research platforms began to emerge, too. One of the first was a Navy research tower off San Diego, under the direction of Dr. Eugene Lafont. The main advantage of an oceanographic platform or tower such as this is that of stability. Instruments can be put in the sea at a given depth, given place, and record the variables of the ocean, and particularly that of motion. The tower eliminates the wind effects on the tower, the current effects, and the wave effects, which are detrimental in the study of surface waves, the internal waves between the layers of warm and cold water, and other things about the sea surface. One study going on now is uh, concerned with this radar reflector behind me. It is used, being used now to study the roughness differences between the normal sea conditions and the slicks that exist on the sea surface. The slicks are the lighter streaks on the ocean between the rougher areas. They are caused by the accumulation of film, organic material at the sea surface, 
and they are believed to be related to the internal waves. Another advantage of the tower is permanency. We can put instruments in here and record for long periods of time and get things that have cycles of days, weeks, or months. The tower was built in 1959 and has served the Navy to study the sea surface, the sea floor, the water in between, and even the atmosphere, the meteorological conditions just above the sea surface. But platforms like this have a limitation. They cannot move. One answer to the need for platforms which are not fixed in one area is buoys. And the Navy is attacking this challenge by sponsoring the development of a variety of fascinating and ingenious scientific buoys. The Bumblebee buoy was designed by John Isaacs of the Scripps Oceanographic Institution in La Jolla, California. For the last uh, 18 years or so, my colleagues here at Scripps and I have been working on deep sea moorings. And this is our latest model. We have some five or six of these strung out across the middle of the North Pacific, moored in water uh, two or 3,000 fathom deep. Inside the catamaran is an instrument package recording temperature down to 1,000 feet uh, below the surface of the sea and uh, meteorological parameters such as wind speed, wind direction, uh, sunlight, and those other necessary measurements for our understanding the great fluctuations that influence the Pacific. The dials are photographed by camera every one hour and uh, the data is picked up every six months by boarding the catamaran in the open sea. In order to survive the weather of the Pacific, the catamaran bumblebee buoy had to be designed so that it would be self-riding even when completely capsized, when overwhelmed by a sea. It has survived the worst weather that the North Pacific can turn out. The typhoon with 90 knot winds and 40 foot seas and three knot currents all combined. Uh, it survives these to some real extent by following in the troughs rather than being hit by the great combers that these winds produce by virtue of its uh, mooring system, <clears throat> the tension and the warm mooring. Uh, some aspects of the design might not be so obvious to a person, and uh, one of them, for instance, is that it must be ugly and not appear to be very useful so that the passing merchantman will not pick it up and add it to his small boat fleet. Our entire purpose in this is to try to understand how the Pacific influences the entire weather of the northern hemisphere. Apparently, the weather, the fluctuations from year to year and decade to decade are engendered in the North Pacific, and we are trying to understand how that process works with these moorings. The monster buoy, also sponsored by the Office of Naval Research, is another step forward supplying real-time information directly to a computer ashore. It is perhaps the largest and certainly the most complex moored buoy ever built. 40 feet in diameter, it has an all-steel hull with a discus shape that follows the slope of the waves, minimizing pitching and rolling. On board, it contains instruments for air and sea measurement, as well as electronic and power equipment for collecting and transmitting information. On command from a monitoring station ashore, the buoy can radio its data to any point within 2,500 miles. Water temperature, salinity, currents, precipitation, barometric pressure, air temperature. All this is recorded ashore on a regular schedule. In addition to its use as oceanographic data, this information is of immense value in weather forecasting. For weather is often born or modified as a result of sun and air interactions with the oceans that cover two-thirds of the Earth's surface. The oceanographic research platform called FLIP was developed by the Office of Naval Research. At dockside, it looks like a ship. Or does it? From the tip of its bow to the stern, it's 355 feet long. And almost all of that length is a cylindrical pipe with nothing but empty tanks.
What kind of a ship is this? If you board flip alongside a dock, you'll be certain you're inside a ship designer's fantastic error. Some shower drains are on the bulkheads, and wash basins are both horizontal and vertical. Some instrumentation is designed for normal reading, some apparently for use while stretched out on the deck. But take flip to sea and watch what happens. On station, the crew floods the ballast tanks that make up 85% of her length. As these fill with water, the stern gradually sinks and the bow begins to rise. Then as the ballast tanks fill, the whole bow lifts from the ocean and things begin to happen. Bulkheads become decks and decks bulkheads while men are holding on. The ship is no longer a ship. It is now an oceanographic research platform, one of the most stable in the world because of its fantastic length beneath the surface. More than 70 expeditions have been conducted by scientists aboard this unreal craft. Studies have been made in such fields as wave attenuation, sound propagation, seismic wave recording, and measurement of internal waves. Flip has ridden out 60-foot waves with little vertical movement. Flip's steadiness in heavy seas has led to studies of the use of more than one such column to support larger platforms. A three-legged model is being tested. The working and living areas would stay in one position, as does the platform of the model. There's a two-legged version also, this time with the platform swiveling to remain level. An experimental join-up for a larger work area. All this has led to studies of very large platforms for ocean research and other purposes, explained by engineer Bob Bedor of the Navy's Undersea Research and Development Center. You see an application of a single floating vertical column. We at NUC have been working for several years on using one of these modules as the basis for very large platforms. A very large platform in our thinking would be something perhaps 5,000 feet long and several hundred feet wide. This is a scale model of a full-size module which would be 50 feet square across the top and approximately 250 feet deep. Our initial studies centered on the idea of whether it were possible to construct such large platforms and if constructed, would they have any feasible applications. We concluded that there were many such applications for the Navy and we concluded that if such platforms were to be made, that very likely they should be made of a reinforced concrete and a modular concept. Later on, we moved on to more specific studies, and one of these specific studies had to do with this platform we see out here called the Mobile Ocean Basing System Platform. Its full-size model will be 1,750 feet long and perhaps 500 feet wide and 250 feet deep. Notice that in looking from below, 40% of the columns are not present. Our wave studies show but this will decrease the motion of the platform in heavy seas. In application, the Mobile Ocean Basing Systems platform sets offshore. Cargo ships come alongside, offload their cargo. The cargo is then transferred to the shore by a helicopter, aircraft, or small boats. There is still another oceanographic research platform, one made by nature, and by nature at its harshest. T3 is an ice island floating in the Arctic Ocean. Here, oceanographers pursue their scientific research on the roof of the world and in the ocean beneath the ice cover. This is important research, for it is vital for the Navy to know not only the characteristics of the ice cover, but all about the icy waters beneath, down to the sea bottom. Much of the research is done in the icy heart of winter, and when the spring thaws come, you may have to move, and sometimes move quickly in search of firmer ice. The oceanographer assaults the unknown from his research platforms in and on the sea. And he uses flying platforms too, aircraft of the Naval Oceanographic Office, gathering oceanographic and other environmental data over large areas of the ocean almost instantaneously. And today, environmental scientists get an overall view of the world's oceans from orbiting satellites.
But ocean engineers and scientists have long known that for some studies, it is necessary to go into the depths of the sea using their own eyes and ears and brains. Today, the underwater explorer becomes a part of the environment in fully transparent vehicles made possible by new advances in technology. A leader in this new technology is Dr. Jerry Statue, Navy Materials Specialist. This is a vast ocean, and its surface has been studied for years from airplanes and ships. But in really to learn what goes on in the depths, the man has to descend into the ocean and observe for himself. The material that makes this possible is acrylic plastic. A material that not only gives you visibility, but also provides the strength to resist the crushing forces of the depths. The Navy has supported a program that has developed to date an ambitious submersible called NEMO, the Naval Experimental Manned Observatory. It is an acrylic bubble incorporated into a submersible system. The submersible permits man to descend to depths of 1,000 feet and visually explore the ocean floor and the depths between it and the surface. This particular bubble that one sees here is designed for only 60 feet and it will be used as an elevator on the offshore tower to study the ocean floor and the life that clusters around the offshore tower. The research vessel CC gives mobility to the acrylic ball for use in behavioral studies of marine life. William Evans, a staff scientist at the Naval Undersea Center, explains the concept. CC is a catamaran vessel that has suspended between the hulls a seven foot long, five foot diameter capsule, which is capped on each end with an acrylic plastic hemisphere. In addition to this, the vessel is equipped with a great deal of oceanographic uh, equipment. Uh, specifically, forward here in the cabin or the wheelhouse, we have an automatic direction finding system, which was designed specifically for tracking large marine mammals. The acrylic observation platform is lowered beneath CC, and the observer feels that he is moving among the porpoises. CC's observation sphere is used by many scientists for varying purposes. Perhaps the most exciting is the Navy's shark studies program, usually with the vessel dead in the water and the sharks attracted by chumming. The Navy is interested in the behavioral aspects of sharks, to improve the safety of all who enter the seas. Sea lions swim fearlessly among the sharks, and one tries to steal a piece of bait. The acrylic plastic sphere gives the scientist a widescreen view beneath the sea. Glass spheres are being used too. This one on an experimental deep submersible. The developer is Will Foreman of the Naval Undersea Center. This project is called Deep View, and it represents one of the first structural applications of glass for the underwater environment. The design depth is 1,500 feet, and it's been tested to 4,500 feet. There's no substitute for having man in the ocean in a transparent hull submersible so that he can see and judge what he's seeing at the time he's doing it. However, for some hazardous remote locations that are such as a sunken ship, the anthropomorphic vehicle and the series like it were developed. These are transparent hulled unmanned submersibles and provide a safe and remote viewing of the undersea environment. We couple the operators vision to a vehicle operating in the water. The submersible and the camera uh, moves due to rate gyros uh, located on the helmet that the operator wears in identical pattern to the motion of the head as uh, the head is tilted up and down the camera tilts. As the chair or the head are moved uh, in rotation, the vehicle moves in like manner so that it is identically oriented to the operator's head. The effect of this viewing submerged is so real that uh, several uh, peculiarities have developed. 
from the flinching due to objects uh, coming into view and to the almost sudden realization that your feet are not below you when they should be. The, uh, even a feeling of coldness uh, is, is possible. When the operator tilts his head to the left or right, he gets a real-like uh, view as he would uh, on, on the surface of the sea. The anthropomorphic TV sphere carries man's eyes and ears beneath the sea. And there's a platform to take his hands and his working ability down there, too. Developed at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography by Dr. Victor Anderson. This is RUM, our remote underwater manipulator. It's a little out of its element here. It's designed to work on the bottom of the sea. It's lowered down on a cable and controlled remotely from a surface platform. There's a control console on the platform at which an operator sits and can view things on TV and sonar. RUM has a number of instruments on it. The major one is the underwater manipulator arm. This is used to pick up objects to take cores and can be used in recovery of things from the sea floor also. We have a special platform that we use to uh, handle rum at sea. Behind me is Orb, our 45 foot square ocean research buoy, which we use to take rum to sea. Orb has no propulsion power. We have to tow it to sea with a tug. It does have power on board to lower rum to the seafloor and operate it, however. In the deck house, we have a large well, which has two doors that open downward into the sea. Rum is lowered through these doors to the seafloor over a large coaxial strain cable to uh, carry rum and support it on the way to the bottom. Must man depend on remotely controlled devices or can he learn to work in the deep ocean himself, free like the fish and the porpoise and the seal to move where he wills? The Navy believes both capabilities are essential. It is developing platforms that can be lowered to the ocean bottom, carrying men trained to breathe exotic gases instead of air. Men who will be able to move about, to work and study at depths undreamed of a few years ago. For the Navy's missions of salvage and recovery, construction and surveying, and many other tasks undersea. This new kind of ocean platform will also be a refuge for man, the underwater explorer. A friendly environment, a transition vehicle which at last enables man to move between the depths and the surface. On oceanographic research platforms of a hundred kinds, on the sea and beneath it, above the sea and on its frozen surface. The Navy, joined by other scientists and engineers, is developing new techniques, new technology, and new equipment. This assault on the unknown is a drive for new knowledge about the sea, for the nation's defense needs, for commerce, for science, and for future generations.